So the last time, which I think it was two weeks ago, um, I did the subject, Thy Kingdom Come, part one. Um, if you are listening to this part two and you did not hear part one, you can find access to it on the YouTube channel, uh, Green Tree Ministry. And part one is essentially the foundation for part two. And so make sure you avail yourself and uh, watch that part one as we move forward into part two. Now, I have a prayer thought. Uh, it is taken from two places, Romans 3, 1 to 4, and also Review and Herald, September 18th, 1900, paragraph 8. It reads, it says, after his resurrection, he said to them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was with you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and, at, and that repentance and remission from, of sin should be preached in his name among the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. The Bible now seems a new book to the disciple, containing definite instruction. They saw that the events which had taken place in the suffering and death of their beloved master were a fulfillment of prophecy. And then in Romans, it says that it might be fulfilled. It says Romans 3, verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So what we are seeing from this is that God's word is given, predicting things into the future, and his words must be fulfilled. Notice that in the highlighted red, it says, Christ declared unto them that all things concerning him that was spoken of the prophets had to be fulfilled. And because the disciples had missed many of the things that were written and forecast in the scriptures, uh, they had a very disappointing experience, especially as it came up to the crucifixion and death of Christ, right? But after they understood, it said that the Bible now seemed a new book to them and they came to understand fully that all that was written was part of prophecy. And in, in Romans, Paul is saying, it doesn't matter whether or not we choose to believe what God has written, God himself will remain true. In other words, if he gives a prophecy and we choose to ignore it, we choose to disbelieve it, we choose to think of it that, you know, oh, it'll never be fulfilled. It will not in any way change God's perspective. He will fulfill his words regardless of us. So as we kneel, our prayer today is that we will have faith in God's words, that we'll have faith in the prophets, in the writings of the, the, the prophecies written in the Old Testament, and that we may have the source of strength and that we will avoid the great disappointments that the disciples had. Let us pray. Our eternal Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace and love. We thank you for your written words. We thank you for the words of inspiration through your prophets. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that gives us understanding and bring these things home to our mind. Even now, God, I ask for your divine spirit to be upon me as well as upon the hearers so that your words and your words alone might be heard and that you will be glorified in all things. Grant your wisdom, grant your grace, and may the line function and operate clearly so that souls may be edified and that your kingdom may be advanced. In Jesus' loving and holy name, amen. So.
So just a quick recap. In our last part one, we covered uh, a lot of the Old Testament prophets and we looked at some of the prophecies that was written concerning Jesus and his mission on earth. We also spent some time, a great deal of our time in the New Testament where we looked at those who were expecting his coming. We looked at the, uh, the, the wise men that came from the East, Mary, the mother of Jesus. We looked at the disciples. We looked at Zacharias, John, all of the, the, the believers, so to speak, surrounding Christ. And we look on the perspective that they had of his kingdom. We understood that there were prophecies that pointed to the death and resurrection of the Messiah. But tied to those prophecies were prophecies that pointed to his crowning, his, his, uh, his kingdom being established, him ruling on the throne of David. And so we learned that the apostles, even those closest to him, even John the Baptist, right, all longed for the establishment of the temporal kingdom. Some of them completely ignore the spiritual kingdom, right? But like for John the Baptist, he knew that Christ would have to die, but he also believed that the other prophecies would be fulfilled. And so we close at the resurrection of Christ where Christ met with the disciples and he started explaining to them all these things, what had happened. And, they, and then they asked an important question. They said, now that we understand that you had to die, you had to fulfill all those prophecies concerning your death. Is it now, is it at this time that you will establish or restore again the kingdom of heaven? So what they were looking for now was the other prophecies that related to Israel being reestablished as a kingdom, as a nation. And Christ said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the season that the Father has put in his power. So picking up right there, what we are going to do is we're going to look at and see, are those prophecies going to be fulfilled? If not, why not? If yes, when, how, why? We want to look at all the details relating to the kingdom that these disciples had been looking for. And so let's move forward, right? Now in Romans chapter nine, the apostle Paul is writing and he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So he's speaking about the Israelite people now, right? He says, they are Israelites to whom pertain it the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law and the service of God. And the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. So notice what Paul puts in terms of emphasis. He puts that the promises of God that pertains to the adoption, that pertains to all the covenants, the law, the service of God, all these things were for Israel. And by extension or through Israel, the rest of the world. So when you look at how Paul writes, even when he writes of salvation, he says to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. When Christ was speaking with the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, he says, ye Samaritans know not what you believe. He says, for salvation is of the Jews. That's a very important statement that Christ made when he says salvation is of the Jews. In other words, he's not saying that salvation is only for the Jews, but he is saying it is by means of or by way of the Jewish lineage that salvation is given to all the world. In other words, even to Abraham, it says in, in, in thy seed shall all nations be blessed. So the, the, the gospel itself and the promise of full redemption is through Israel as a nation. Prophets and Kings, page 22, it reads, uh, it says, of special value to God's church on earth today, the keepers of his vineyard are the messages 
of counsel and admonition given through the prophets who have made plain the eternal purpose in behalf of man, in, in behalf of mankind. So it says the church on earth today, right? The messages of the prophet are of special importance to us. In the teachings of the prophet, God's love for the lost race, his plan for their salvation are clearly revealed. The story of Israel's call of their successive uh, of their successes and failures of rest of their restoration to divine favor and of their rejection of the master of the vineyard and the carrying out of the plan of the ages by a godly remnant to whom are to be fulfilled all the covenant promises this had been the theme of God's messengers to his churches throughout the centuries that have passed. So notice now, the highlighted blue portion deals with ancient Israel. And it says all of that was written, right? The highlighted red portion, it says that the full fulfillment of the covenant of the promises will be by a godly remnant. So God still intends to fulfill his promises. And what ancient Israel has failed to do, it says a godly remnant in our day today will fulfill all the covenant promises. Patriarch, uh, Prophets and Kings, page 713, clearly stating the same thing. It says that which God purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through his church on earth today. He has led out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, even to his covenant-keeping people, who will faithfully render to him the fruits in their season. Never has the Lord been without true representatives on representative on this earth who have made his interest their own. These witnesses for God are numbered among the spiritual Israel, and to them will be fulfilled. All the covenant promises made by Jehovah to his ancient people. So the promises that God has made through the prophets, inspiration is here telling us that they will be fulfilled. They must be fulfilled according to the words of Christ. So therefore, it begs the question, when? When are these things to be fulfilled? Now, we already have an insight that tells us the goodly or the godly remnant will fulfill that. And we know the remnant are those that will live in the last section of earth's history. Now, going to uh, Daniel, let's begin at Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And for those of us who are familiar with the dream found in Daniel chapter 2, it was an image that reflected the various nations of the world that were to follow from Babylon on to, so to speak, the second coming of Christ. And so this image of various metal, the head of gold, uh, uh, breast and arms of silver, uh, belly and thigh of brass, legs of iron, and the feet, part of iron and part of clay, is a representation of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the kingdoms that followed in succession that God allowed to rule for a time, right? Now, in that prophecy, the Bible tells us in verse 34, it says, Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Daniel 2.34. Picture is depicting the stone coming from the skies, right? The second picture on the right is depicting what the stone really is, and it is, it, it is, it is commonly taught that this stone is Christ at his second coming in his glory with all his angel as is seen in that second picture, right? But if we are to read the scripture as it states, we will see a slightly different picture, right? The Bible, according to verse 45 of Daniel 2, it says that the stone was cut out without hands, right? But it also went on to say where the stone came from. Bible says the stone was cut out of the mountain 
without hands, right? And so this, this picture on the, on, on the right of the page is a more accurate description of what Daniel speaks of, right? And so Daniel 2, 44 and 45, it says, and in the days of these kings, and these kings that is referring to are the present kings of the world, the 10 toes, so to speak. Some are weak, some are strong, they're mingling together, they're trying to come together as one, but it, it, it is in our present world, it says, in the days of these kings, while they are still ruling, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So we have our time frame. During the days of these kings is when God will set up the kingdom. And it says, this kingdom shall never be destroyed. Notice the next phrase now. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. In other words, it will not pass from one nation to another, but this will be the last kingdom that will be before this world comes to an end. And then it says, it shall break in pieces. Now, what is the it? What is the subject that we have been talking about? The it is a clear reference to the kingdom. So it says, it, the kingdom, shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. So in other words, for this kingdom to destroy the other kingdoms, it must be an, in existence contemporary, uh, uh, alongside these, these, uh, these other kingdoms in order to bring an end to them, right? And it shall stand forever. It says, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands and that it break in pieces the iron the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God have made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So this stone was cut out of the mountains, not from the sky, as that picture shows. Now, that explanation begs another question. What is then the mountain from which the stone was cut out, right? Now, we, we, we need just look in Daniel for him to explain what a mountain in prophecy ref refers to. And so in Daniel 9, 19 to 21, Daniel is praying for Israel, his people, because he is in Babylon and he's remembering the prophecies of Jeremiah and realizing that the time for Israel return has come. And so he's pleading with God and he's praying for Israel. And he says, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. So he's praying on behalf of his people, Israel. During that prayer, Daniel says, and while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Notice that. So Daniel is here likening his people has a mountain, a holy mountain of God. Now, he is not the only one who does that. When you go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah pulls the same uh, 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 analogy where he likens God's people to a mountain, right? And so in Isaiah chapter 2, 1 to 4, it reads, and it shall come to pass in the last days, reading from verse 2, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. So here Isaiah is depicting that in the last days, in the present world that we live, right, God will set up his kingdom. He will establish his church and his church will be higher than any other denomination. And in fact, all nations, the Bible says, will flow onto it. In other words, it will be a, a growth. It will be an addition. It will be an outreach, so to speak, where souls are added to the kingdom of God. It says in verse three, and many people shall go and say, come ye. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his path for out of Zion shall go forth the law. And remember Zion 
was the hill on which the kings dwelt in, in, in Israel, right? For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So what we see here is that the final outreach of the gospel will go forth from Jerusalem. God's church will have its base in Jerusalem. In other words, the kingdom restored again, right? Notice this now. It says, and he shall judge among the nation and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshare and their spears into pruning hook. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So in the time of this kingdom, there is depicted a peace that is unknown to this day, right? Where, where as we will see, even among the animals, there will be peace. Micah, in Micah chapter 4, continues that same subject, just reiterating the same fact that a mountain in prophecy is a reference to God's church. Micah 4 verse 1, it says, but in the last days, same reference, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house, of the house of the Lord, shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it, right? And many nations shall come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and the, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his path. And same reference as in Isaiah, for the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So this message is reiterated in various prophets, in Micah, in Isaiah, and as we will see, even in other prophets of the scriptures, right? Now, this is not a strange phenomenon where God likens his church to various things. In Jeremiah 51, we find another portion. Notice this now, Jeremiah 51, verse 19 and 20. It says, the portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things. And Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe and weapon of war. For with thee, I will break in pieces the, the nations, and with thee, I will destroy kingdoms. So notice in, in Jeremiah, God is given the same picture that he paints in, in, in Daniel chapter 2, where this stone is the instrument to destroy the kingdoms of the world. Jeremiah sees this same process but instead of a stone, God is saying, you are my battle axe and I will use you to bring an end to the kingdom of this world. So God intends by his kingdom, by his church, by his consecrated ministry to bring an end to the kingdoms of the world, right? In Jeremiah 12, Jeremiah brings out even a clearer application of the same principle we find in Daniel. Because while Christ is the stone, the Bible is clear, Christ is the chief cornerstone, the Bible is also clear that his church is also referred to as a stone. Jeremiah 12, verse 3, and in, the day, in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces though all the people of the earth be gathered against it. So this prophecy finds its fulfillment in a time where all nations on the earth are against God's people. And God says, I will make my kingdom, I will make Jerusalem at that time a burdensome stone for all people, right? Continuing, it says, in that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood. And like a torch of fire in the sheep, and they shall devour all people round about, on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Notice that. So God is here prophesying of a restoration of godliness in Jerusalem, where Jerusalem is literally on fire with the Holy Spirit, right? The Lord also will save the tents of Judah first, and that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Now, he is picturing 
a full restoration where Israel, the 10 tribe, is not against Judah, the two tribe. Now, if you remember, at this point in time where Jeremiah is prophesying, Israel was no longer in, ex in existence. They had been wiped, so to speak, as a nation from the face of the earth. So Judah was the only two that were remaining. But here's a prophecy depicting a full restoration. Verse 12, verse 8, I mean. It says, in that day, the Lord shall defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. So this restoration depicts a group of, uh, of believers that are empowered to serve, that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that are righteous. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. So in this day and age, God will use his kingdom to bring an end to all the kingdoms of the world. Now, what about the phrase cut out without hands, right? Now, volume five, page 79, Ellen White is, is writing and she says, we have been inclined to think that where there are no faithful ministers, there can be no true Christians, but this is not the case. God has promised that where the shepherds are not true, he will take charge of the flock himself. He has never made the flock wholly dependent upon human instrumentality. But the days of purification of the church are hastening apace. God will have a people pure and true in the mighty sifting soon to take place. We shall be better able to measure the strength of what? The strength of Israel. So inspiration is pointing forward to the Seventh-day Adventist church, a time when the strength of Israel will be able to be measured, when God will have a people pure and true, a Israel that is fully restored, that is doing his purpose, that is doing his will, right? And so the purification is the means by which God will cut that stone out without hands because we remember he is the one that uh, ordains and the angels are the one that do the separation according to Matthew 13. So it is cut out without hands in a miraculous manner through the divine uh, uh, precedence of God, right? Continuing prophets in Kings 725, it says, clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon her final conflict now, I want you to notice the term conflict is a, is a term that is used in reference to war, right? And it says the church entering upon our final warfare will do so in the armor of Christ's righteousness. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banner. She is to go forth where? Into all the world conquering and to conquer. So the stone, its purpose is to take the gospel into the world as is seen by the stone smiting the image at its feet, right? And by taking the gospel into all the world, we are in, 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 in essence in battle, so to speak, against the powers of evil. It says, in that day, only the righteous are promised deliverance. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness have surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us will dwell with everlasting burning? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. So there is coming a time, believers, where the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, will be in such a state where sinners and hypocrites will not be among them. The question is asked, who among us will dwell with the devouring fire? And it says, only he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. So a kingdom on the move. So this that we're talking about, this uh, uh, purified ministry, this church fully restored, right? is also pictured in the book of Joel, Joel chapter two. And notice how Joel puts it. Joel says, 
Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. So Joel is prophesying of the last day when the greatness of God is about to be revealed, right? In verse two, it says, it is a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And then he uses another phrase that seems to be a paradox. It says, as the morning spreads upon the mountain. So here he's talking about a dark and gloomy day, but at the same time, a day of sunrise and beautiful morning. It is the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It is great for many, but dreadful for others. Light and beautiful for some, dark and gloomy for others. It says that day will produce a great people, a strong. There have not been ever the like. Neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So this people that Joel is speaking of has not yet been produced because he says there's not ever been the like, neither will there be any more even to many generations. He is making reference to that group of people that will exist and labor for Christ after the purification. He says a fire devoured before them. Now remember we just read where Jerusalem at this time will be almost a heart of fire. The spirit of God will be filled every believer, right? We just read before this, who among us will dwell in the devouring fire? And here Joel is saying that the church at this point will be such as it was during the apostles where Hananias and Sapphira, where sinners were afraid to join themselves unto the believers, right? And so it says, a fire devoured before them and a flame burneth behind them. The land is as the garden of Eden before them. In other words, their destination is Eden. And behind them is a desolate wilderness. In other words, if you get left behind, you're hopeless. There is no hope for you. A desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. So notice that. Every single soul will have an opportunity to get a witness to make a decision for God or not for him, right? Continuing in verse uh, with verse uh, four, it says, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the, the noise of chariots upon the top of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoured stubble as a strong people set in battle array. The same context is used again, set in battle array. It says, before their faces, the people shall be much pained, all faces gather blackness. In other words, the final movements will not go out with, 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 with weakness. God's church will triumph is what this passage is saying, right? It says, they shall march everyone on his way. They shall not break their ranks. In other words, it will be unity, right? And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Verse 10, it says, the earth shall quake before them and heaven shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executed his words. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. It is called a great and dreadful day of the Lord. And who can abide it? So God will have his army that he will show before the world. That he will use, so to speak, to bring an end to the kingdoms of this world. So now that we have covered the when, we know it will be on this side of eternity before the second coming of Christ, because that kingdom needs to bring an end to the kingdoms of this world, right? Why is it necessary for God to reestablish the kingdom of Israel? Why could he not just do it some other way, right? Let's look at a few reasons. The first reason is found in Titus 1 verse 2, and it says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie 
promise before the world began. When God makes a promise, he holds himself to that promise to fulfill it because the Bible says he cannot lie. And so the promises that God has made concerning the kingdom of Israel, he has to fulfill them. Isaiah 55 verse 11 puts it another way. It says, the word that goeth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, right? And so in verse 40, in verse, in verse nine and 10 of Isaiah 46, God is setting himself apart from all other gods. And he says, there's none like me. Verse 10, I declare the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do my pleasure. So one of the things that sets God apart from all other gods is when he declares something to happen, it will happen. Daniel 9 verse 4, Daniel praying to God, he calls God the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him. Imagine the kind of God we would serve if he could not be trusted to keep his covenant. But we serve a God who keeps his covenant, right? And even if we do not believe, according to 2 Timothy, if we believe not, yet he abided faithful, he cannot deny himself. So this may seem difficult to grasp, difficult to hold, to believe, but yet still God is saying, I will fulfill it whether or not you believe whether or not you think it's going to happen, right? Continuing with the why, let's look at another reason why God has to reestablish his kingdom. And this reason is found in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, God has a picture. He says, son of man, now remember when we did part one, we established that when God chose Israel, he put them in that particular spot because it was the center of the then world. And Israel's purpose was to show the gospel to all nations and their borders would expand till it engulfed the whole world. Remember that. Now, Ezekiel now is writing. Now, remember, Ezekiel prophesied at the time when Judah was going to go into captivity. Israel by this time had been taken away, right? And it says, son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doing. And he says, their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman, right? And the Bible says in verse 19 that God scattered them among the heathen and dispersed them through countries according to their ways and according to their doings, he judged them. Verse 20, it says, and when they entered in unto the heathen where they went, they profaned my holy name. Right? So even when the children of Israel went into Babylon in captivity, it was but a handful that stood up for him. Daniel and his three friends, but there was no mention of Israel as a nation serving God faithfully. Right? And the people that conquered them, what did they say? Oh, these are the people of the Lord. Right? And so God was highly dishonored when his people were the bottom, were the tail and not the head. Right? Because even in Babylon, the nature of these kingdoms is to think that if I conquer you, then my God is greater than your God. And so God had to work to reestablish his dominance among these nations. Verse 21, why is the reason why God is going to reestablish Israel? Here it is. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen whither they went. So this is all about God's name. It has nothing to do with us and our desire to move to Israel. It has nothing to do with us and our desire to have an earthly kingdom. But the Bible says God had pity for his holy name, which we had profaned among the heathen. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which he have profaned among the heathen whither he went, right? Notice how God is going to accomplish glorifying his holy name. It says, I will, be sanct I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen. How? It says, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, 
And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. So God is saying, you who have brought shame and dishonor to my name, how I will magnify my name again is to sanctify you in front of all these heathens to see how he can take something that is dirty, that is a failure, and to magnify himself through it is marvelous indeed. God says, I will glorify myself by sanctifying you before the eyes of the heathen. And so in verse 24, he promises, he says, I will take you from among the heathen. I will gather you out of all countries and I will bring you into your own land. He promises he will reestablish them. He says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take away your stony heart of flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Notice the next phrase. And you shall dwell in that land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Now, if you remember when Israel came back from the Babylonian captivity, this cannot be said of the Jews because they themselves rejected the very Messiah. So this still stands to be fulfilled where a people have been cleansed from all their idols and a new spirit has been given to them and they walk in the ways of God and the heathen round about get that witness of a kingdom fully restored where, where saints are fully sanctified before God. This has not happened yet. And God is saying, I will accomplish it, right? Continuing, he says, not for your sakes do I do this. In fact, he says, be ashamed and be confounded for your own ways, right? Highlighted portion, verse 35, it says, when he accomplishes this, when he rebuilds Israel again, it says, this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. Remember, we just read in Joel, where it says, before them is as the Garden of Eden. Here, Jeremiah's, Ezekiel is picking up the same subject, and he's saying, when God restores the kingdom of Israel, it will be like a Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are to become fenced and inhabitants. This is to happen, why? So that God can reach the heathens round about. Verse 36, then when he does all of this, the heathens that are left round about shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant the desolate. And it says, thus saith the Lord, I will yet for this be inquired by the house of Israel. In other words, he's saying, while I have promised that I will do it, it is your responsibility to pray for it, to plead with God for it. He says, to this point, I still expect you to inquire of it for me. And he says, when you do that, I will increase them with men like flock. It is no different from Christ saying to the apostles, when you pray, says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, even before you ask for your food. God is here teaching us that this kingdom is yet to be inquired of by the house of Israel. We are to pray for it. We are to work for it. We are to desire its coming because it is the means by which God will reach the world. And so Ezekiel brings out what Jeremiah has shown, what uh, Daniel has shown, and what other prophets Micah has shown so far. So in Daniel 2 verse 35, it is interesting where it says that the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so that very stone that was taken from the church by means of the purification, when it smites the image, it says that stone grows into a great mountain and fills the whole earth. In other words, the gospel going to Babylon, the gospel going to the world produces a harvest. This kingdom, when men see what God's power is able to do, 
they will join themselves, like Isaiah says. All nations shall say, come, let us go. And that stone, a small kingdom, will grow into a great mountain until it fills the earth. And so when the Bible says, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, it will be the knowledge that is shown by sanctified ministry, by that kingdom nucleus, so to speak. Right? So we will be on display for the glory of God. This is from volume six. It says, it is God's purpose to manifest through his people the principles of his kingdom. That in life and character, they may reveal these principles. He desires to separate them from the customs and habits and practices of the world. He seeks to bring them near to himself that he may make known to them his will. The Lord desires, listen to this carefully, through his people to answer Satan's charges by showing the result of obedience to right principles. So the greatest blow that God can give to the kingdom of Satan is a sanctified people who have now committed their lives to live lives of obedience to right principle. And it says that he will silence Satan by showing the result of these people living righteous life. It says all the Lord designs, all these, sorry, the Lord designs shall be symbols of what can be done for the world. They are to be types of the saving power of the truth of the gospel. So when the world sees what God is able to do through us, in us, and for us, it will give them an idea of what God is able to do for them. And that is the witness that God is looking for, for the world. And so the next questions that we're gonna deal with is how? I mean, this thing sounds marvelous. How is this going to happen? How is the Lord going to pull this off? What will it look like, right? Ellen White in Testimonies to Ministers right into a particular location. We do not know what the location is because it was removed, but the message is clear. It says, unless those who can help in blank are aroused to their source, to their sense of duty, they will not recognize the work of God when the loud cry of the third angel shall be heard. Now, we know the loud cry of the third angel is that final message that goes to the world. That is the stone that is smite in the image, right? It says, when that work goes forth, many will not recognize it. It says, when the light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Listen to what she said. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. So the way in which this gospel will close, inspiration is here telling us, many will have an idea in their mind of how they think the gospel should close. And that idea will be at cross purposes with what God has in mind. The Bible says our thoughts are not God's thoughts. He will work in such a way that will be very different from the common order of things and contrary to human planning. It says there are those among us who will always want to control the work of God, even to dictate what movement shall be made when the work goes forth under the direction of the angel who joins the third in the message to be given to the world. So notice that the final message does not go forth under the direction of the third angel. It says it goes forth under the direction of that fourth that joins the third, right? And so the very last movement that goes to the world will be vastly different from what many Seventh-day Adventists have in mind, right? God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins in his own hands. The workers will be surprised by the simple means he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. So it will be simple, it will be profound, it will be effective, and it will be contrary to any human planning. That is how God intends to bring the gospel to a close, right? Now let's look at what this kingdom will look like. Let's look at Ezekiel 38, right? 
Uh, Ezekiel 30, let me just double check. I believe it should be 30, 36. Yes, that's supposed to be 36, not 38. Actually, 37, Ezekiel 37. So this is from Ezekiel 37, 16 to verse 17. It's in the small right-hand page. So at the top, I have Ezekiel 38. That's an error. It's 37, right? Now, in Ezekiel 37, God gives Ezekiel a prophecy. And he says, he says to Ezekiel, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel, his companion, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim for all the house of Israel, his companion. So the two sticks, Ephraim ref referring to the 10 tribes and Judah referring to the two tribes were to be placed together and they would become one stick in his hands, the whole house of Israel, right? Join them together to one another into one stick and they shall become one in thine hands. Now, this is important to understand because at the time Ezekiel is writing this, the 10 tribe was not in existence. So this is a prophecy pointing forward to a time where God will reunite the whole house of Israel, the 10 tribes and the two tribes. And this is, this is significant because from the Babylonian captivity forward, even to the days of Christ, it has only been the two tribes that has been referenced, Judah or Jerusalem, the 10 tribes were still the 10 lost tribes, right? And so in 2 Kings 7.23, the Bible says, until the Lord remove Israel out of his sight, as he has said by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. So this prophecy has never yet been fulfilled where all the tribes of Israel have been reunited. You say to me, well, the Bible says, if he be Abraham's seed, he are heirs according to the promise, right? Now, while that is true, this prophecy is very specific. And let's look at what I mean when I say very specific, right? Ezekiel 37, read in verse 21. Listen what it says. And say unto them, when they ask, what does this mean? You will say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen whither they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. So this is what I mean when I say this prophecy is specific. It's not talking about Christians that are uh, grafted into Israel through accepting Christ. This is talking about an actual restoration of the kingdom of Israel in the land of Canaan, right? And it says, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. They shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols. So this prophecy is a prophecy of the full restoration of Israel as a kingdom. Verse 24, notice now, it says, and my, and David, my servant, shall be king over them. Now, this is interesting because David had been dead for centuries. But here God is saying, David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgment and observe and do my statutes and do them. Now, remember when we looked at part one, we, we understood that what Israel had under King David was a theocracy, that God was in charge, David was his shepherd, so to speak, and he, through David, he ruled over Israel. Here God is saying, I will reestablish that, right? Verse 25, and they shall dwell in the land that I, I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. So this is not a prophecy referring to, to heaven. It says, they will dwell in the land that God gave to, Jer to Jacob and where our fathers have dwelt. 
They shall dwell therein, their children and their children forever. And my servant David shall be a prince forever. Here is the same reference again. Moreover, notice this now, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant. I will place them and multiply them. So this is during a time where souls can be added to the kingdom of God because the number is increasing. He says, I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them. In other words, his presence, like in Isaiah, will be as a flaming fire in the midst of them, right? And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Notice verse 28 now. It says, and the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. So all of this here is for the sake of the heathen to know who God is, to be one to the kingdom of Israel. God's purpose for Israel has always been the same, has never changed, and will be fulfilled by modern Israel, right? Notice that it speaks of peace, right? A theocracy again. Ezekiel 34, picking up the same subject, it says, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, their God, will be, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make a covenant of peace with them, and I will cause the evil beasts to seize out of the land. And they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the wood. This kingdom that God is prophesying of, he will be in charge and he will have David, so to speak, whoever David is referring to as one in charge, a theocracy that faithfully serve him. It is a covenant of peace where even the animals themselves will dwell safely. And we will see a little bit more what this looks like. What will cause the heathen roundabout to be able to look on in awe and say, I want to be a part of that. This is what we're talking about here, right? Hosea, in the book of Hosea, Hosea picks the same subject up that we have been reading in Jeremiah. And it, it, in chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. It shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, You are not my people, it shall be said unto them, Ye are sons of the living God. So even though Israel as a nation dis dishonored God and they were rejected by him, when Christ was on earth, he says, your house is left unto you desolate. He says, in that very same place, God is going to use the same people to fulfill what they have failed to do. Isn't God marvelous? In spite of ourselves, God is going to bring righteousness out of us. And it, it is amazing because for another person, it is easier to discard and just make something new. But God's glory, his glory shines brightest in impossible circumstances. When he takes the failing person and brings righteousness, his righteousness out of them, it magnifies his name greater than if he had made a whole new race, right? It says, then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel, notice both be gathered together and appoint themselves one head. So notice now, even though the scripture says God will appoint them one head, it's here now he's saying they will appoint themselves one head and they shall come up out of the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So this prophecy is not just something that was spoken of to Jeremiah. Hosea had the same prophecy. And as we will move forward, we'll see it multiple times. In Hosea 3, verse 4, God is speaking. He says, for when the children, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without a teraphim. Afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And, the, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness. When? In the latter days. So in the latter days, God will reestablish the kingdom of Israel. He will reestablish a theocracy with someone in charge that rules under him, so to speak. A nation, a kingdom 
that will honor him with holiness. Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah picking up this same subject out of the mouth of multiple witnesses. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I've driven them. And I will bring them again to their foes. And they shall be fruitful and increase. This is during probationary time. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And they shall no, fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. A king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So this verse 5 is a reference to Christ, right? The Messiah that shall come, but here it is tied to him reigning and prospering. This was what the disciples were looking for, the full fulfillment of his kingdom. But here, God is saying it will happen in the last days. Verse 6, it says, in his days, Judah shall be saved. Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby ye shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. So God will have a kingdom of righteousness in the last days that will fully fulfill the prophecies that he has given. Continuing the same Jeremiah 23, verse 7. It says, therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth that brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. They won't say that anymore. What will they say? But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries that I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he executed, till he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In other words, the second coming of Christ cannot happen. He cannot come to judge the world until he has performed the promises he made. And then it says, in the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. Jeremiah, Isaiah, for something that is spoken of in so many prophecies, Throughout scriptures, it is amazing that the church on earth today wants nothing to do with it. It reminds me of the, the, the flood. When God says it's going to rain, they say, oh, it's never rained before. No, it will never rain. And when it finally rained and God says, I will never again destroy the earth with the flood, what did the people do? They said, it's going to rain again. It's going to rain, right? It always seems that Satan is able to tempt the people of God to disbelieve his promises and his prophets and to believe the opposite. When God, Christ walked this earth, he says, I will fulfill the mission of dying for your sins. Israel says, we don't want a dying Messiah. We want a king to reign. And finally, in the latter days, when the king shall reign, so to speak, when Israel is to be restored, what is modern Israel saying? We really don't want a physical kingdom. We want the spiritual one. We're missing the mark, just like ancient Israel, right? And for something that is taught so profoundly in scriptures, how can we believe in God when he says, I have gone to prepare a place for you, if he fails to fulfill these promises? Think about it. He said to Nicodemus, if I've told you of earthly things and you cannot believe them, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? If God cannot fulfill earthly promises he had made, how can we trust him to fulfill the heavenly one? In the latter days, these things will be fulfilled. Now in Jeremiah, Jeremiah makes it even clearer that not just the latter days, but in the, the latter days, where the time of trouble will be coming around. Jeremiah 30, verse 3. It says, For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of the people Israel and Judah. I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Verse 4. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands upon his loin as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day's great, 
so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but ye shall be saved out of it. We fully believe in the time of trouble. We teach it as Seventh-day Adventists. But here, tied to the same time of trouble, God is saying that is the time in which Israel will return to their land and possess it. But we ignore verse 3, and we hold on to verse 5 to 7. We cannot do that. We have to take God's words as a whole, right? Will we believe the prophets is the question. Jeremiah 30, verse 8, continuing. That same prophecy that speaks of the time of trouble, it says, for it shall come to pass in that day, in the same time of trouble, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke of thy neck. In other words, Israel will be freed, so to speak, from the yoke of the nations. And I will burst the bonds and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. So whoever David is, the Bible says, God will raise up unto them. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it. In other words, God, Christ cannot come to judge this earth by fire until he has performed the intents of his heart. What does he say? In the latter days, ye shall consider it. Time and time again, all these prophecies are showing that God intends to establish his kingdom, what it will look like, when it will be, and why, right? Now, let's look at what as we move forward quickly. What is the purpose of this establishment of this kingdom? Why? Why can't we just proclaim the gospel as we have been doing thus far, and then Christ comes and wraps everything up? What is the purpose behind it? What is involved? Matthew 13, verse 41, right? It says, the son of man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. So before Christ returns, he says, the purification, God will send his angel to pull out of his church, his kingdom, all things that offend or do iniquity. Remember, we just read where inspiration says the days of purification are coming quickly. And after it happens, we will be better able to measure the strength of Israel, right? It says, and cast them into a fire furnace. There shall be wailing and gnashing of feet. Notice verse 43 now. It says, then... After that purification, then at that time shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So not until those that offend or do iniquity are removed can the righteous truly shine. And so the process is God intends to have a kingdom that will shine for him. And he cannot do that without first purifying his church, right? And so when you look at the word offend in the Strong's G4625, Scandalon, it, it translates, it translates a stumbling block, an occasion of stumbling, an occasion to fall, right? Or a movable stick that triggers a trap or a trap stick. Right? So anything that will impede one way causing them to fall. So what God is removing from his kingdom are those that will trip others, those that will cause others to stumble and fall. So when you look at the picture, there are many people in God's church that are a hindrance to the progress of his ministry. People in the world will look and say, oh man, there's so many hypocrites in the church, right? And God understands when they say there's so many hypocrites. Now, they're not guiltless, but God understands that in order for him to magnify himself through his people, it has to be a sanctified ministry, fully his, right? Now, let's look at the statement in, in councils and, uh, and on food and diet, page 455. Hello, White says, if the members of our church disregard the subject of health reform, disregard the light on this subject, they will reap the sure result of both spiritual and physical degeneracy. And the influence of these older members will laven those newly come to the faith. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth, 
Because the church members who have never been converted and those who were once converted, but who have backslidden, what influence would these unconsecrated members have on the new converts? Would they not make of no effect the God-given messages people are to bear? So in other words, she is saying right now, the numbers of our church could be growing exponentially, but God is not working along that lines because there are too many trip sticks. There are too many that offend that are within his church that will make null and void the, the marvelous work that he intends to do. So what will he do? He has to remove the trip sticks. And then he will work to add many souls to the truth, right? So when the ministry is purified, look at what Zachariah uh, portrays it at. Zachariah 14, 20, it says, in that day, there shall be holiness upon the bells of the horses, holiness unto the Lord. And in the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea shall be holiness unto the Lord. And they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see it therein, and in that day there shall no more be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. This kingdom will no longer have tripsticks, will no longer have Canaanites, unconsecrated members within its midst. Verse 4, verse 1, uh, uh, one to 4, this is Psalms, in Psalms chapter 1, 4 and 5, it says, the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. We repeat Psalms 1 all the time. But as Seventh-day Adventists, how many of us really uh, process that it's in reference to the Latter-day Church where God will have a congregation of all righteous? where no Canaanite will be among them. And you say to me, oh, no, Brother Henry, uh, there was always going to be sinners in God's church. Well, either these verses are lying or we have misunderstood. According to these verses, God will bring about a ministry that is righteous, right? Isaiah 31, 5, it says, as birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending it, he will deliver it. And passing over, he will preserve it. This kingdom established, it will be God's responsibility to protect it. To protect the airspace above. To protect it from, from all nations round about. Right? Zechariah 2, 5. It says, for I, say the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about. And will be the glory in the midst of her. Nahum 1, verse 15. Behold. Upon the mountains, the feet of him that bring it good tidings, that publish it peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast. Perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. So God will have a ministry where the wicked will no longer pass through this ministry. But God will have a ministry that is pure. In Isaiah 66, Isaiah brings the same subject from a different perspective he says when the lord comes and this coming when you look at the subject is not his second coming as we will see but it's a coming to judgment he says he will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire for by fire and by his sword will the lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the lord shall be many the word plead there means judge. So by fire and by sword will the Lord judge all flesh. But the subject is dealing with his church, right? The subject is dealing with his church. And so when he comes to his church, as in Malachi, uh, Malachi 3, he will purify the sons of Levi, right? Verse 18, it says, for I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. So notice how, how easier, I, I, I don't want to say easy, but notice how, how witnessing, how the gospel will change once God has a purified ministry. 
instead of us going out and searching and seeking and trying to find all these, these souls, right? Here, the scripture says, God will gather all nations and he will bring them and they shall come and see his glory. So in other words, at that point in time, God will allow the gospel to go forth with such fire that nations will be coming to the, to, to the kingdom of God to join themselves unto them, right? Verse 19, it says, I will set a sign among them, among the heathen. What is that sign? I will send those that escape. Escape what? Escape the purification in the church. He will send them unto the nations. Why? Highlighted red, that they may declare his glory among the Gentiles. So this coming in verse 15 is not a second coming because in verse 19, those that escape the separation of that coming in verse 15 are now empowered and sent unto the Gentiles. And what do they do? It says, they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, right? To my holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. Here, it says that the vessel of the Lord, the house of the Lord will be a clean vessel. How dare you tell me that God will never have a people pure and true? God will have a pure church, and it will be the means by which the gospel will go to the world in its fullness, right? Now, the end sign that they will see is found in Isaiah 11. In Isaiah 11, we have a pictorial uh, image of what the kingdom would look like. Isaiah 11, verse 1, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now we know that's referring to Christ because Christ came through the lineage of Joseph. Uh, of, uh, not Joseph, of uh, Jesse, right? He was of the lineage of David. He was called the son of David. So this branch will grow out of the root, so to speak, of Jesse. And it's referring to Christ, the savior, which came, right? And it says he, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord will be upon him. And he shall make, it shall make him quick of understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither shall he reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So this portion, Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, is a prophecy of Christ. And so the apostles would read this, and they would say, wow, this Messiah, when he comes, Israel will again have righteousness. He will smite the whole earth with the rod of his mouth. Now, according to Revelation, we know this will happen at his second coming, when he smite the earth with the rod of his mouth right? But before his second coming, we will see the remainder of the prophecy fulfilled. Isaiah 11 verse 6, it says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. In other words, the kingdom, when the kingdom is restored, when the end sign is fully restored, remember we had read that he will even cause the, the, the peace to be among the animals. We read that before. Here, Isaiah is bringing it full circle around. It says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. This is peace unheard of. The nations of the world will be awed to see something like this. The cow and the bear shall feed and the young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw as an ox. Imagine, brethren, something like this happening in our world today with the technology that we have, with how news travels. How long will it take for the world to be able to see this and to be wondering at it, to say, wow, I need to know what that's all about. And the suckling child shall play in the hole of an asp. An asp is a viper. It's a pit viper. And the weaned child shall put his hands in the cockatrice den. That cockatrice is said to be one of the most poisonous snakes. 
It continues. It says, they shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Now notice, this passage of scripture is so remarkable that many have taken it to mean that this is a reference to the new earth. But it cannot be for various reasons. Let's look at verse 11, verse 10, I mean. It says, and in that day, in the same day, speaking of the same prophecy, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So brethren, this is happening in probationary time when the Gentiles, when the world can see this and they can seek unto it. This is happening. This is God's marvelous ensign that the world will be able to see and come to know the living God, the true and living God. So this is not by any means the new earth because by the time we get to the new earth, everybody that enters heaven had to go in through one of the 12 gates. And so they'll be grafted in to the Israel as a nation because on the gates, there were the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So everybody that is saved in heaven will ultimately be grafted into Israel into one of the 12 tribes. So there will be no Gentiles in the new earth and there will be no no, no um, saving, so to speak, in the new earth. Probation would already been closed and the gospel completely wrapped up, right? And so when the Bible says the great mountain filled the whole earth, continuing Isaiah 11, same prophecy, it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord, the same time where he sets the ensign, that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people from Assyria, Egypt, Papros, Cush, all these nations, right? Verse 12, and he shall set up an ensign for the nation and assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersers of Judah from where? From the four corners of the earth. This kingdom will incorporate a full restoration of Judah and Israel. Verse 15, right? Jumping down, highlighted. Many people ask the question, how are we going to get there, right? But it, it shows a lack of faith in God because it is easier by human standard to get to the promised land than it is to get to heaven. But we don't ask the question, how are we going to get to heaven? We believe it. And here God is saying in verse 15, and the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind, he shall shake his hands over the river and shall smite it into seven streams and make men go over dry shot. It is not we that are going to take ourselves there, brethren. Inspiration tells us just like how he part the Red Sea for Israel, he will do it seven times as great so that his people, he will take them there. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. Brethren, this is marvelous. Will we believe God? It's funny that that spit of land, the center of the world, is one of the most hostile places on, 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 on this planet. There's always some kind of war going on over there. But here God is saying, it will be the place where he pulls all eyes to see his goodness and his glory. And then coming to a close, the Apostle Paul brings this picture from a different perspective in the book of Romans. He says, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off. And thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but, thou, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. What Paul is writing, he's writing to the Gentiles in Rome, and he's saying, listen, the Israel as a rootstock is still God's plan. 
And even when Gentiles are saved into the kingdom, they are saved by being grafted into Israel. And so the kingdom of Israel will essentially be the, the, the nucleus into which all nations are grafted in. And so when you go to Revelation 7, Revelation 7 sees Israel, sees the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And then after that, he says, I saw a great multitude of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongue that could not be numbered. That great multitude is ultimately grafted into the kingdom of Israel, right? Paul in Romans, after reading what God has planned, he declares in Romans, verse 26, it says, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I take away their sins. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. For who have known the mind of the Lord or who have been his counselor or who have first given him and it shall be recompensed again unto him. For of him, through him, to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Brethren, I trust that you have been blessed by this subject. I trust that your hearts have been warmed and that you have been uh, encouraged to have faith in the words of God because his words cannot fail. How he, was, he is going to pull this off, I don't know. But what I do know is his plans for us in these last days is glorious and I want to be a part of it. Jeremiah 32 verse 27 says, I am the Lord. The God of all mankind, is there anything too hard for me? That is a question God is asking. So brethren, will we believe his promises? Will we work for his kingdom? Will we believe his kingdom? That's what God is expecting of us. He is looking for a purified ministry to be used by him in a capacity that has not yet been seen by this world. May the Lord help us that we'll be fit and ready for his kingdom. Let us pray. <clears throat> our gracious Father and our God in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and kindness to us. We see the plans you have for us, O oh Lord, plans to prosper us, to give us a good end, O oh Lord, plans to glorify yourself by sanctifying yourself through us. Help us, O oh Lord, to cooperate with you to allow the spirit to remove from us our idols, our ungodliness, our sins, so that we can be transformed, O oh Lord, into the ministry you deserve, into the ministry you can use as an ensign to the nations. Forgive us when we doubt your promises, O oh Lord. Help us not to be like the disciples where we hold on to the things that appeal to our, to our desires, but help us to believe all your promises, all that the prophets have spoken. May those who hear this message be stirred, O oh Lord, to have faith in the promises of God and to hold fast until you fulfill these things. May we pray for your coming, work for its upbuilding, and thank you for this beautiful Holy Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>